But I said it wasn't just that the West is often too greedy to stand against China. We have also been dozy, complacent about the fast-growing threat. Three years ago, the then Turnbull Liberal government prepared a white paper on defence, saying you know, this is where things are going in our region and this is the kind of armed force that we'd need to respond. And the government said, for instance, we'd need 12 new submarines, $50 billion worth, but we can wait until 2050 for the French to build the last of them, 2050. But now, just three years after that white paper, the Defence Minister admits that things in our region, brackets, China, and technology are not waiting for another 31 years until Australia fully arms. That white paper is already out of date. It's self-evident that the geostrategic circumstances we live in, technological disruption, is changing. And I think every single Australian would expect us to make sure that not only do we deliver this capability, but we make sure that it deals with emerging threats. What a surprise. In just three years, China suddenly looks a lot more threatening. But please wait, China, until 2050 when our last submarine turns up. Dozy and greedy for China's money. China must be laughing. Joining me now is Dr Marcus Hellyer, a senior analyst with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, who specialises in defence capability and military technology. Dr Hellyer, thank you so much for your time. Uh, what did you, you make of the defence minister saying today, and I'm quoting, the world has changed more quickly than we assessed in 2016? And for defence, that means we have to assess these changes and challenges in a hard-headed manner. What made her give this reappraisal? Well, I think one interesting thing is it's not the first time we've said this. In fact, if you look at the history of Defence's white papers over roughly the last 20 years, we seem to do the same thing again and again and again. We do a white paper and then a few years later we say, oh, we underestimated the speed of China's growth and the speed of the development of its military power. And it's not just us, but the US seems to do the same thing as well, which would suggest that if we keep getting it wrong, there's something fundamentally wrong with the way we're doing business. But as the Defence Minister said, it is self-evident that things have changed. And there's one of the clearest signs of that was the Chinese effective annexation of the South China Sea. Interestingly, in the time it took us to sit down and write the last white paper, the Chinese simply went out and annexed the South China Sea. So we, we, we seem to be behind the curve in the speed of our response to what China is doing. Next, you'll tell me, uh, Dr Hellyer, that China didn't get around to issuing a white paper before it stole the South China Sea. I mean, really, this is just... You're scaring me here. The, there's also the change in technology. I mean, just last week, for instance, uh, China was showing off this hypersonic missile, about a dozen of them with nuclear warheads, that are reportedly capable of reaching the US in just half an hour. And I read that it's also got weapons that can destroy an aircraft carrier with virtually no warning at all. What message should we be taking from that parade? Well, it's not just that parade. It's a long campaign that the Chinese have been doing to essentially... It's called an anti-access area denial strategy. They've been developing weapons that can push the US forces far out to sea. So if, for example, they did decide to uh, invade Taiwan, they could... Uh, push the US out to sea by essentially sinking the, their aircraft carriers. And uh, so this is one of the big challenges that not just the US but we also have to consider, that the Chinese are developing a lot of weapons that are designed specifically to sink ships. But as you noticed, um, a lot of our effort is going into uh, building new ships. So uh, you might wonder whether by the time those ships arrive, whether they are actually survivable in the future environment. That is a fairly freaky um, conclusion because I also read, of course, that China's apparently got a new laser capable of uh, detecting submarines 180 metres below the surface. Now, we still, though, do have these 12 submarines. They're still to be 
rolled out gradually over the next 31 years when France gets around to start to build them, that is. Uh, and that's in part because, you know, we're against nuclear subs, so they have to be resigned for diesel and we want them built in Australia, so that obviously may, means more delays. Is that a project that you're saying now is like, you know, commissioning the latest Zeppelin in the year 1900 for delivery in the middle of World War II? Well, I think it would be a very brave person to come out and say right now that we should turn off the future submarine project or indeed the future frigate project. Um, you, you referred to the Chinese laser. We shouldn't um, essentially take that at face value and say that submarines are obsolete. Many people around the world have been looking for the magic sensor that can penetrate the oceans and detect submarines deep underwater. No one's really been able to do it yet and it probably will take some time. Similarly, the hypersonic weapons, we need to uh, distinguish between reality and the Chinese claims. We, like on many things, we shouldn't take Chinese claims at face value. But I think you take all of those things together and the world is, getting a much, is becoming a much more dangerous place. So um, what's the answer? Well, as the Minister said, we need to be more agile. We need to be ourselves be investing in emerging technologies, whether those are things like hypersonics or cyber and some of those other things which China is uh, investing very, very heavily in. The problem that Defence is in is that so much of its uh, investment budget is going on the future submarine, the future frigate, armoured vehicles, projects that won't deliver until 2030 or even later. So the question is, what do we do in the meantime? How do we free up uh, investment cash, free up people's uh, time, free up headspace, free up the resources of our universities and our industry to invest in those new emerging technologies that we need much sooner than 2030 or 2035? Well, from what you just said, I suspect this is uh, Dorothy Dixer. Is our level of defence spending acceptable? Well, uh, two percent. There's nothing carved in stone that says two percent is the right number. So countries that face serious threats, such as Israel, spend a lot more. If you're Belgium, then maybe two percent is okay because you've got the UK, Germany, France, Italy. Uh, surrounding you, all of whom are countries with a, the GDP bigger than Russia's, so the Belgium can rely on those other countries. In our situation, the only country we can really rely on is the United States, which admittedly is the most powerful military in the world still. It's still more powerful than China. But if the issue is China's power is growing and we're starting to have some doubts about the, how much capacity the US has to help us if we really need it, then we might need to think about spending more than 2%. If we look historically, since the end of World War II, throughout the Cold War, Australia actually spent more than 2%, at times even more than 3%. Why? Because we were in a time of strategic uncertainty. It was only at the end of the Cold War that our defence budget fell below 2%. And now it's climbing back, and the government has made a commitment to get to 2%, and I think that will happen. But if you look at the world around us, are we in a time of strategic uncertainty? I would say yes. Can we rely to the same degree as we have on our major ally? I'm not saying the US is going away. I, I'm not saying the US will abandon us. I'm not saying the US will leave the Pacific. But I think the US is expecting all of its allies to step up and do more. Dr Marcus Hellyer, for your sobering analysis, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thank you, Andrew.